Patreons. We thought we thought maybe some Patreon thank yous were were in order. It's been since October since we did that. A big thanks to Ishpal Bomber. A thank you to Andy Hurt. Thank you to Nano Wizard. And to Andrew Mills. To Jason Hickey. Sabrina Landazuri. And Fox Deploy and his dog Bernard. Particularly thank you to his dog Bernard. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, of course, we should always thank dogs before yes. anybody else. Bernard is the so, best yeah. boy, best patron. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if, if you've donated to Patreon in uh, 2022 and didn't hear your name, let us know. Um, thank you again to all the patrons out there, those who continue to support us uh, despite the ads. Uh, I really appreciate that people are willing to, to continue to give, you know, and um, yeah, it's just it keeps the podcast going and keeps us in beer and food money it's great <laughs> <laughs> it's thank you so much yes thank you so much for your votes of confidence and your your literal dollars of votes of confidence we appreciate you all so much oh hey uh i'm back my mouth is mostly healed <laughs> yeah how's that going yeah so it's been three weeks exactly since i went in for oral surgery to get three of my wisdom teeth removed i just finally got the stitches out yesterday and i'm so happy oh my god it they had to reschedule me out so they were in for an extra week and it was the most frustrating thing um but i'm basically back though you may have noticed i sound kind of funny and that's because i got a bit of nerve damage from the anesthetic needle on the right side and so the right half of my tongue is still numb and will be like that for up to six months so uh yeah welcome to that sound from me but otherwise uh, <laughs> i'm good i'm good it was it was a lot guys that was the first week was a haze of just netflix and pain medication and i couldn't really eat so i like lost way too much weight and watched well, I didn't watch too much Netflix, but I watched a god awful amount of Netflix. Um, it was really delightful to just zone out. And then after about a week, I kind of popped up a bit and I could start to function a little bit. And it's just been like these layers of coming out of it ever since. And I'm pretty much back. And I'm really glad I never have to do that again. Cause, uh, oof. This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Chapter 26. Uh, what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> it might as well be. Yeah. <laughs> it's called expectation, but like, let's be real. We know what that's an expectation of. But yeah. Having a baby because somebody's pregnant. Yep. Elaine has been knocked up. This is the beginning of the Elaine is pregnant saga, which never ends because she never has the babies on screen. So she's just pregnant from here on out. I was honestly very disappointed that it never ended. I, I was really ready to see post-pregnancy Elaine and it just didn't happen. You'd have to stick her in like one of those uh, vacuoles where time moves faster. <laughs> Like, that's the only way to get her to, to have the baby in the required time. Although I do think that would be cool, right? Really yeah. go steal an idea from the TV show Angel and have the kid grow up inside some fast-moving dimension hellhole um, so that Rand's kid can, like, challenge him and fight him at the last battle. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be fun. Yeah. I'd be into that. And it, in world, it could totally work. It totally could. The mechanics are yeah. already there, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And our symbol for this is just a snake in the wheel because it's the circle of life. <laughs> uh, I guess politics, that's the only other thing that it could represent is sort of just like the mechanisms of the turning of the wheel and the politics and the way people come together. We've got dream stuff and future shadowing and past no, remembering. That's, yeah, the dream stuff. Uh, yeah. It's a catch all. <laughs> but yeah it's it's a whole lot of elaine stuff and yeah <laughs> i, I hmm. uh 
that just mm, Elaine? It's, you know, this is this is the stuff when people complain about pregnant Elaine and why it's frustrating. Some of these stuff, but I, I did find some interesting nuggets in here, right? Like that's the thing is it's not it's not all Elaine being pregnant. There is some really interesting dream stuff in here. Yeah, no, and I mean this is a lot of Elaine. This is not the worst of the Elaine pregnancy plot, in my opinion. No. This is, if it had stayed at this level of annoying, I don't know that it would be quite so notorious. Agreed. But yeah, we, we should, we should actually probably start walking across the brown grassed village green of Emmons Field with Egwene. Elaine felt saddened by the changes. Egwene seemed stunned by them. When she first appeared in Teleran Riyadh, a long braid had dangled down Egwene's back, and she was in a plain woolen dress, of all things, with stout shoes picking out beneath her skirts as she walked. Elaine supposed it was the sort of clothing she had worn when she lived in the two rivers. Now her dark hair hung about her shoulders, secured by a small cap of fine lace, and her garments were as fine as Elaine's, a rich blue embroidered with silver on the bodice and high neck, as well as along the hem of her skirt and her cuffs. Silver-worked velvet slippers replaced the thick leather shoes. Elaine needed to maintain her focus to keep her own green silk riding dress from altering, perhaps in embarrassing fashion. But for her friend, without any doubt, the changes were deliberate. Um, so yeah, Emmons Field is changing. It's you know something we've seen a few times with the girls. Uh, obviously, we've seen it through parents' eyes, but this is now becoming a kingdom very quickly. I think a little more quickly than is absolutely reasonable. It's one of the reasons I would love to see the books. I, th I think if they had taken place over a decade rather than like two and a half years, a lot of the changes would have been more believable. Yeah, the, the amount of development is like, you sure that Tarman Gaiden time warpy thing isn't already happening? <laughs> right, right, yeah. Maybe think time's moving a little slower in the two rivers. Yeah, because they need to, like, mature and prepare. Yeah, it's it's nice to see, like, this is where the two rivers is going, but it does feel a little rushed. But it shows, you know, all the changes that have been made in terms of, like, styles from Tarabon or Aradamon are coming in. Like, there's roof tiles in every color of the rainbow as the Amarlin who almost fell in love with a tinker, looks at it. You know, like, there's a lot of good visuals. Well, and meanwhile, Elaine going, mm, this place is looking a little too much like a kingdom and a little too little like an outlying village of my kingdom. So she's getting a little um, fancy and her pantsy. But, like, not the pants feelings. It's very much not pants right, feelings. Right. <laughs> but yeah, no, she's looking at it as as a as a threat. Right. This is a potential right. threat. This is potentially like what Camelin looked like once upon a time, right? She can see that's where they're going. That's where they could be going. And she's there to like literally do recon. Like literally that's part of why she's there, is so she can look around and get a sense of what it's like on the ground in what could be enemy territory at some point in the future. Um, we get a little information about the bond and the world of dreams. The brand's in her head, but there's no direction. Right? She can still feel that he exists, but, but Teleron Riyadh isn't a physical place, so there's no physical direction to point to. So that makes sense to me. I like that. Yeah. It's nice to have that sense of, now. this is not in the same dimension, really. Your soul is there, but like, nah, your body is not part of this equation. The next thing I have is the, what fits this chapter into the timeline. Elaine is talking to Egwene and says, I know you are moving the army tomorrow. So that means this is actually a flashback to the end of the Path of Daggers. Like this is the day after chapter 30-ish something of the Path of Daggers, right? So uh, again, just the, where, you know, we're like halfway through this book and we're going back in time to see what Elaine's been doing this whole time. Like, this is definitely a jump back in time to Caitlin to check in with Elaine and be like, so, meanwhile... Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> like, <laughs> Very much so, because there's a lot of moving parts. And this is the beginning of feeling like the desyncing is, is really getting pronounced. I feel like the desyncing has been happening before now, but this is maybe one of the first moments when you're like, oh, we are really desyncing. And we're going to be like that for a couple of books before things get brought back together. Oh, I don't know if things ever. I mean, I think the last couple of books, Memory of Light is just, I mean, 
the way, the way parents timeline is just told completely out of order to everybody else's. Um, yeah. it's really hard. And then with the, the time stretching when you're further away. So like some of the kingdoms are experiencing, experiencing months, some are experiencing days, some are experiencing like well, what feels like almost a full year. Yeah. Well, there, there's an attempt to bring them back together <laughs> that will happen in a few books. Yeah. An attempt yeah. is made. <laughs> the guide does happen in one day, technically. Slash well, several no, months, right. slash one right. book, slash one chapter. Mm. <laughs> slash three books. Yeah. 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 But yeah, this is this is kind of the beginning of, of the wheels are starting to fall off <laughs> a little bit of the continuity. <laughs> And then we get an interesting conversation from between them, you know, kind of about leadership where Egwene is like, I don't think I can go back and face these people as who I've become yet. Elaine's like, you should totally go back. Because like, for her, right, leadership is like always who she's been. Egwene's like, mm, I'm not ready for them to go through the adjustment period. Like, that's rough for me right now. Because she says, you know, she's already had to have women she grew up with switched because they don't respect her, right? Like, Elaine would never end up in that situation. Like, the people she grew up with knew she was daughter heir the whole time. There was nothing like that for Amarlin. That also reflects back on Nynaeve, because that's what Nynaeve had to deal with was when she became Wisdom, is all these people around her viewing her as a young girl, even though she had this position of authority that she wanted to, you know do a good job in, but all the people around her are being like, oh, that little girl, and yeah, Egwene's dealing with the same thing. And she's just avoiding the issue. She's like, nope, nope, I'm good. Yeah, pretty Don't much. deal with that. Defer yeah. She's going to defer that until she wants her mother's permission to get laid. Isn't that the weirdest tradition? Asking parents, hey, can I fuck your daughter? I mean, marry your daughter. Right? Like, uh, such a weird tradition. Women as property. We love to Never see really it. Yeah, well, that's that's what it comes back to. Yeah, it's, um... but yeah, it's. Uh, <sighs> I've been. I'm almost to the end of his dark materials. It's been great, and uh, it's just. It's all about the first time you get pants feelings. That's the whole goddamn point. <laughs> it's just such a funny elephant in the room for all this eloquent allegorical storytelling and excellent writing and good. It's about people getting pants feelings for the first time. I love it, but it's so funny. I mean, isn't everything, right? <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> everything in the coming of age department uh, is explicitly about that, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's just so like, Eve has to fall, and it's like, Eve has to get horny. That's mm -hmm. what you're saying. <laughs> do, do I have to go back to my theory on the cleansing? And how Nynaeve puts up a beautiful flower that Rand then rams his power through? No, nope, you don't. You don't. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But thank you for going there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> At your service, man. Uh, yeah. And you were watching the TV show, right? Yeah, the HBO uh, version of it. I think I'm going to finish it tonight after this recording. I think we're going to watch the last episode. Brandon got into it with me, which was really fun. So I've actually been pacing myself through it instead of just binging it all at once. Also, it was actually coming out as I was watching it. So I was forced to wait. Um, do, 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 do. Strategy, strategy. Egwene offers military support to Elaine. Elaine declines. Egwene does not press the issue because recruiting is a plot line we need to keep track of, I guess. Well, uh, it, it's a lot of what's going on everywhere, right? Every single army is recruiting. Parents' army is recruiting. Gwen's army is recruiting. The White Tower is recruiting. The pattern is weaving towards the last battle, and everybody is getting forced into an army. And like, in, even in the very end, right? Like, the only place anybody can get food is in the army, so they go join the army, right? And it's just it, it's this snowball effect where it's like, hey, everybody. I need you to fight in the last battle if you possibly can. So, you know, it's not exactly a draft, but it sure as hell feels like the pattern itself is drafting people um, to go to battle. Yeah. 
Yeah, and also drafting people to be the generals who have the mature realization that whatever I decide, people are going to die for it, Mm -hmm. which is a thing that Rand and Elaine share later on. That's one of the things Sanderson has, you know, Rand being like, hey, Elaine, this is part of why I love you so much is because you understand this. And here's Elaine and Egwene having the same connection. Egwene's like, hey, Elaine, you actually understand this, this heaviness that comes with being the leader of an army and... I wish Egwene and Rand could have had a a buddy moment about that. That would have been good. But at least we get it between with the hinge of Elaine. Mm -hmm. That's that's, we at least get that. Yeah, the antagonistic relationship between Rand and Egwene kind of sucks. It would have been really nice to see them come back together and be like, hey, remember that time when we were in love and we were working towards a common goal? Let's trust each other and help each other and actually, you know, have this great Amarlin Aes Sedai the dragon reborn relationship, right? That we otherwise wouldn't have, but I trust you because I know you. Right. And now we've been through a bunch of the same stuff and we have learned a bunch of these tough lessons and we can understand these decisions in a way very few other people can. And isn't it weird that we used to be in love and now we can be colleagues and uh, the reunion scene that we deserved. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Some some of my best friendships are with people who I thought, Maybe I'm going to fall in love with this person. I'm like, no, we're just going to be friends. That's that's way better, right? Like, I definitely have, have had some of my favorite friendships come about that way, where it's like, hey, we're flirting. No, I got the ick. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's just be – but we still get along really well, so let's hang out, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's – people are – Interesting people are interesting. And to be honest, I look at Rand and Egwene and they look at each other and went, nah, it's like dating myself. That's a little too a little too intense, right? Like I need to date somebody who balances me. You know, like Wayne's really smart, so she has to date an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, And it's like, that's fine. Like That would have been a great reunion scene of like, we've come so far, and yet we have so much in common in a completely different way than we used to think we did. Like, that would have been mm -hmm. such a cool, like, exposition way of like, reexamining the books and the whole arc right before they go into the battle. Yeah, we're just writing fan fiction that doesn't exist, but... Anyway. Yeah, well, you know, maybe that's what we can do when the, uh, we get to the end of these books is just start writing our fan fiction and do that through podcast <laughs> form. I mean, there's weirder niches out there in podcast land. Uh-huh. Collaborative fanfic podcasting? I think I'm, I'm here for it. I mean... Where we get everybody to sit down and write a chapter and we just read it, we narrate it. Whoa. That would be so cool, honestly. I mean, I'd help produce that. We just we just create the outrigger novels. We're like, what the hell? Why not? <laughs> Five minutes in heaven, my ass. We're just gonna write the books. <laughs> Chat GPI can suck it. <laughs> what well, and uh, as there's a line here, uh, Brigitte, what she heard an era fellow mercenary recruited by Brigitte say, "What was not forbidden was allowed." It's true. Don't don't ask permission. Ask forgiveness. It's very true. Mm-hmm. The tower law does not prohibit what we are proposing. And that's the only law that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's the Amberlin's word. <laughs> um, so there's a little bit here about the eyes and ears being having troubling rumors. And I, I think that's about the eyes and eyes swearing fealty yeah, to Rand. definitely. I think, I think Egwene has mm-hmm. a little bug up her butt about the fact that he's got... I said I kneeling to him and swearing fealty, right? Like, she's not super happy about that. But Rand's doing it, right? Yeah, it's funny how Elaine, be- like, can't believe that that would actually be happening. And it's like, no, it's, like, absolutely happening. Rand would absolutely do it. I said I are absolutely agreeing to it. Albeit with a little nudging from Varen. But, <laughs> but you it's know. Just a little compulsion. Just a light compulsion. Just a little it's, just sprinkle yeah, of compulsion. Yeah, a little top, compulsion, bay. Little... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, I, I did want to note there was a line here about veins of gold again with Elaine and, you know, with him so far away, the veins of gold shown only in memory, Mm, mm -hmm. just a reference to the love that they have for each other. Yep. It's still there. It's still going. There's still hope for Rand. Yeah. And so then we get our 
very, very first hint that Elaine might be knocked up because, oh, she's so tired. She's just so sleepy these past few days. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm going to be like this the entire plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there might be another reason why she's so tired. She and Avienda have been sleeping in the same bed, and I think they might be keeping each other up late. I mean, and then there's that. <laughs> right? I'm just saying. This whole section is extremely sapphic, very gay, very cute. Extremely gay. Yeah, so no, I mean, gay. These are the kind of passages that make me go, okay, my headcanon is that they're together when Rand's not around. Because this, right? Yeah. And And I think there's enough in here that you can just say you know what that you can't argue with that if you want to believe that they've, they're together then you can believe they're together yeah this this is a safe podcast for believing yeah. that because they they are elbowing each other and giggling and getting dressed together and like it, it, there's, the vibes are like mm -hmm, yeah i i just have the hardest time imagining this dynamic not having romantic and sexual dimensions to it i just i'm not i'm not seeing it like Jordan wrote mm -hmm. an extremely gay couple mm -hmm. and they're awesome. I love them. And it's not like he wasn't aware of pillow friends. And, you know, this is a situation where he would say, Hey, they don't, they're too far away from their lovers. So they find comfort in each other. You know, he, he loves situational lesbianism. So, you know, yeah, he throws in these random lines where he's like, Oh, they don't love each other like that. And it's like, you're wrong. Yeah. You wrote a relationship where they clearly do love each other like that. And your your words on right. the page over here in this one corner versus the mountain of evidence that you wrote. Like, I'm right. sorry, you're just wrong about this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his characters are wrong about it. I choose to not believe that. I choose to believe that weird editorial decisions stuck caveats in there so that way douchebags could feel like they were right. And I just, no. I just don't accept it. And I love to how, how here Avienda is getting f all these nice, pretty dresses and silks foisted on her and she's arguing against it, but not actually making it not happen. Mm -mm. She likes being dressed up by Elaine. She likes getting to get into Elaine's world and she won't admit it, but she clearly is really enjoying getting to be a princess's girlfriend like that is actually something she's ashamed of liking but she likes she's yeah dressing up her little wild doll right like, like civilizing the savage a little bit you know there's a little bit of that going on i choose to see it in more of a pygmalion kind of light <laughs> but yeah that ew, ew uh, gross but on the other hand, very in line with the English princess meeting the exotic girl from a faraway land. I mean, that bringing civilization to the other is very much what the English princess, sorry, Andorran princess uh, would do. So that might be gross, but it's very in line with the characters. I can just imagine our coaching at the end to say the plane in Spain <laughs> is <laughs> exactly. Here's how you hold the fork. And oh, yeah. Oh, my God. So many scenes from My Fair Lady. But it's just Avienda staring mm -hmm. straight at the land being like, no. What? <laughs> right. Oh, uh, that would be good. We get a great uh, food description here. This is one of one, Jordan doesn't always go deep into food, but when he does, he always makes me want to eat it. Yeah, um, you know, cured hams with raisins, eggs cooked with dried plums, dried fish prepared with pine nuts, fresh bread slathered with butter, and tea made with syrupy honey. That that is a breakfast. That's too much breakfast for me. I that's too many things. But mm, that is a spread. That is brunch. That is an excellent brunch. It's too much for breakfast. That's a brunch. That's for Avienda. Elaine, on the other hand, is getting porridge. Unsweetened, unseasoned. Can we just talk about how bad that is for a pregnant lady? Oh my fucking god, right? Right? Like, this, this is... He sums up, like, a half century of women's bullshit medical advice for being pregnant. Like in the arc of her first trimester because he gets that uh, Melfane 
that midwife to come in at one mm-hmm. point um, through Asanda, I think. And and she upgrades the entire palace for this diet, for this right. diet that Elena's right. on right now. She is like, that is absolute garbage. You need to be eating. Right. A- First of all, eat anything that you crave. Second of all, eat a lot. <laughs> Like right. this whole like deprivation is like what in the like 1500s fuck you for being a woman will burn you at the stake the day after you give birth. Bullshit is this. Oh, so when I asked if we could talk about how bad this diet was, you you definitely said yes. <laughs> you had something prepared. <laughs> I didn't. Honestly, I just thoughts garbage, explode yeah. out of my brain like. Right. My my stepmom when I was growing up was a doula. So I learned a lot about bullshit in terms of misinformation to do with pregnancy. Just because it she was learning and executing all this doula stuff when I was growing up. And I it's just the the infantilizing, limiting, just archaic garbage and i love that he uses the books to say this is archaic garbage but oh so infuriating nonetheless and this is where i was like this is not elaine's fault like this is not a reason to sigh at elaine and her pregnancy plot this is a reason to sigh at the state of pregnancy information throughout the 80s and 90s when he was conceiving of this plot I, I can roll my eyes at I, I can be frustrated with the characters in this plot, I think. And that's part of where my frustration with the plot comes from is like all these characters just feel like they're doing dumb things. And then we get Elaine's I'm invincible plot line to go on top of that. And it's, it becomes very frustrating. Right, And that has no analogy. The characters <laughs> in the world. No. That's just Elaine being annoying. I like her shame. She's like, Everyone knows I'm pregnant, which means everybody knows how I got that way. <laughs> they know I had sex. Oh, God. They know I had pants feelings. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. That's how you know she's probably a little too irresponsible to be having babies. Um. <laughs> no, I don't think that internalized shame from a patriarchal society is reason enough to not be ready to have babies. Okay, fair. Okay, okay, okay. You can call me out on that one. I, I always thought it was weird how she gets embarrassed with this, given how much her mother was clearly sleeping with Gareth Brynn while not marrying him. And that was just like an open thing. And like how she doesn't ever feel the need to say she's going to get married to any man to do this. Like it feels like Andor is so progressive and not focused on that kind of stuff. And then she has this shame and embarrassment. So it's like they're they're not as like slut shamey but they're still very afraid of the fact that like bodies exist right which is really fitting to the weird puritanical mix-up that we got in the 90s with respect to like we need sex education but also if you discuss the if you think about sex then you've done a bad the 90s were confusing i also just think this is just elaine being a little bit of a teenager right the whole and then there's that you know (laughs) Oh my God, people know, like, you don't want people to know about the first time you had sex, right? Like, that's not something you want. That is sex. very true. Right? Like, <laughs> I mean, that is fair. Right? That's not, not, when that becomes public knowledge, you're just like, oh God, like, I didn't want, I didn't want those people to know about that. That's embarrassing. Yeah, no, there, there's absolutely some very real human, like, but I didn't mean for that one to be, like, an item of note. Because, mm. like, she didn't know she was going to get pregnant. She wanted to. No. She chose to not take any precautions, but she didn't know. Like, the palace knew before she did. Like, that's a really awkward... That That, that is okay. That's fair. Without purity culture and everything, that's still awkward. The whole palace knows you got knocked up before you know that the palace knows you had sex at all. Like, mm. right. <laughs> Yikes. She's pregnant. Really? Oh, okay. Right. The other thing <laughs> I wanted to note about this is she's envying Avienda gobbling her sweets, mm-hmm. the word that Avienda used in their first sister ceremony that Elaine like got her like, you know, bristles all up about like gobbling. I don't gobble. And she's now using that word to describe Avienda. Mm-hmm. I just love that little callback because pettiness between between lovers is delightful. <laughs> she's very jealous. She's like, I want to be gobbling those sweets. Mm-hmm. And if she can't have them, it's like she... If she can't be asleep, then Avienda can't be asleep. If she can have sweets, then Avienda can't have sweets without judgment from Elaine. 
I mean, they're not giving her ham or egg, like the protein. Yeah. She's growing a baby. Give her protein, right? Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Like, t- yeah. like she's, she's eating for two. So you're going to have her eat a weight loss diet, mm-hmm. like without essential micronutrients. Mm-hmm. Like, what are you, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. Yeah, it, it, it makes me angry, actually. Yeah. But she does get good um, advice from the midwife later. I think that it's decent later. I'm glad to get somebody in to, to fix that. You know, that it, that's not just like, oh, and then she had perfectly healthy babies because that was the great thing to do. It's like, no. Yeah. But it's ridiculous that the entire palace of women is crowdsourcing a diet for her. And yet one midwife can come in and turn the whole thing upside down. Like, oh, oh my God. This... One expert can make a difference. In fairness... That that is the history of medicine, <laughs> in yeah. so so many ways. It's one doctor being like, "But what if we washed our hands between autopsies and the neonatal unit?" That's just a waste of time. I tell you what, my my hands get dry and cracked when I wash them too much. That leads to me bleeding, and that that can infect the patient. So you know, I really I don't want to I don't want to do that. I think yeah, I think you're you're really uh, going to lead to more infections if you make me wash my hands yeah and if i insist on it you won't like throw me in a literal insane asylum so that i get beaten to death and lost in obscurity until someone digs up my story forever later you wouldn't do that would you not without lobotomizing you first that's fair (laughs) 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 the autistic deadpan humor is too much right now okay so in comes our favorite misogynistic piece of shit dark friend uh captain melar yes her smoke screen for who who's the daddy (laughs) yeah okay what's the logic there is it just that someone speculated is it something that he like he started the rumor like why did that become the thing that she latched onto why not be like you know hint that it was somebody else I mean, I think it's a combination of it was already there, so she didn't have to work for it. And it's another opportunity to ultimately trip him up and get him out of the picture. Mm. Because I mean, she knows he's a piece of shit who's there to fuck with things, right? Like, she knows that and she's just waiting for the game to play itself out. So this gives her more ammo, ultimately, possibly. But I think it's a lot just a matter of convenience. She needs something, to hide she needs someone other than rand to come to mind and this guy is just handing her an opportunity but i always found that to be flimsy reasoning so if anyone has anything to add to that please because i find that paper thin oh and the eyeless in chat is pointing out that she's eating for three not eating for two because she has twins i forgot thank you eyeless <laughs> but yeah it's a little bit about timing right he shows up he saves her life a little bit later she turns up pregnant right like i can see how the story is easy to tell the captain malar was the one who knocked her out yeah a gratitude fuck yeah, yeah. basically but that's kind of how it has to play out to make him the 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 daddy yeah and, and i see her motivation in wanting there to be no question of it potentially being rand like i see why she wants to right. nip that in the bud and never have rand's name come up in the discussion like her urgency with getting a name out there makes sense to me, but I hadn't thought about how plausible it is because of the whole like he saved me. That does make it like pretty watertight as far as that rumor not losing its efficacy along the way. Right, right. But he's just so skeevy. Right, uh, bad mouthing the people. He, he he bad mouths everybody he works with, including the women, just for being women. He casually assaults them all the time, and everyone's like, "Oh, the really annoying part is where he insults my sword skills because Jordan doesn't understand right. what workplace harassment is like." I guess. Not that I really do either, but like, I just don't feel like that's an accurate representation of how workplace harassment is i don't know i mean i i think you could make an argument as which is worse the physical harassment or the undercutting of your skills in every meeting ever i mean i guess they are like out there risking life and limb for elaine so a little physical assaulting is kind of small potatoes when you might get stabbed in the gut by lunch but it just reminds me of when he had elaine and nynaeve walking through that town getting cat called and like secretly liking it it just Mm -hmm. reminds me of that and Ah. and the fact that it's also just written off as like it's not that big of a deal like at all 
It's just like, yeah, he's got a reputation for like assaulting his coworkers, but like, what can you do? That's how mercenaries are. Like, ugh, it's on brand. I just wish that more people were upset about it. It's satisfying when he's the bad guy and you get to kill him and you get the revenge, right? Like, I mean, he, Jordan is setting him up to be a bad guy. There's no doubt about that. Like, he's not like, oh, and this guy's going to save. The, it's not like Melar changes his ways at the last minute and decides to save the queen and is on her side. No, he's a bad guy from start to finish. He's a scumbag. He touches women. He betrays people. Like he's in it for himself. He it's like cartoonishly yeah. bad. Yeah. But every once in a while, you're going to have a dark friend that's cartoonishly bad. Yeah. But it's just, it makes her seem like she's a very bad judge of characters queen to be like, yeah, this guy that's really terrible. Like, I totally got knocked up by him and he's not going to change in the slightest, despite the fact that he totally gets to strut around no- claiming that he got me knocked up. Like, it's just, she's so savvy in so many ways. And I feel like this is a real... Maybe in another 40 years, she'll be able to advise a future daughter heir on how to negotiate this sort of bullshit with more grace. I mean, I feel like it's partially because she's in a desperate situation. It is hard for her to get experienced soldiers. Um, and that's sort of where she's at. You know, she's only got 32 of her female bodyguard. And that's, you know, Brigida wants 100, right? Easily. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, she's keeping him on... A very interesting leash, right? <laughs> She's like, because he wants to bring in men who will hold her in their hearts as dearly as he does. Which I is one of those moments when a dark friend tells the exact truth. You know, he would get a hundred men who hold her in their hearts exactly as he does. I.e. as a target to be kidnapped and raped and murdered on behalf <laughs> of the dark. <laughs> but um, you're right. She is in a very desperate situation. She has to use someone to bring these people in and so she's just managing to get Brigida to like filter the people that he's doing the legwork for and and not not that I could do better all my criticisms of her I don't think I could do better this is tough Jordan appears to love to have his dark friends build armies for his heroes right he's he's got like Tyene doing it for Rand he's got Melar doing it for uh, Elaine he puts dark friends and bad people you had like Ingtar, you had these, the secondary people, the uh, all the RN to Elida, right? You put these dark friends as the number two guy, never the number one guy, but the number two guy behind the, the throne. It's more support for your Vannon theory, too, because Matt doesn't yep. have one, and Vannon could nope. be. Or Tom Honest, but like, you know. Vannon is the Mondred. You're right, yeah. It's, it's a. Mm. But he's just so cartoonish. Yeah, no, one is no dark bread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I, I expect him to stroke his mustache and say, you know. No, he fingers his chin what's... cleft. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's definitely how Melar does the, the cartoon moment, cartoon villain moment. What was the uh, the skunk? Pepe Le Pew, right? What did he always, did he ever catch I have no idea. Uh, fair enough. That's not in my repertoire. <laughs> So uh, then we get some good news, which, of course, is brought by Master Nori, who's, again, just a really fun tertiary character. This, like, nervous guy who never reads his papers and knows everything in them, but, like, never changes his voice. He's just, there's something about him that's very, uh, we'll say neurodivergent. Can we? Yeah, uh, he, he is the data yeah. of this cast yeah. to go Star Trek on it, right? right. He's, he's that character but he gets way less screen time than that character in something like star trek yeah he's he's definitely our our little neurodivergent goblin that just keeps the books in the corner and pops out to give you some factoids and then vanishes back into his pocket universe again which is why we love him because that's what we do in your ears and someone's like, oh, hey, the Dragon Reborn is ruling. Oh, well, then he needs to take a look at these numbers because uh, <laughs> they, we got a serious problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> it's just like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, and he does the whole, like, he blends the mundane and the exciting together according to his sense of priorities for the city and for the nation. And so you get, you know, a, an accountant's bird eye view of how the apocalypse mm-hmm. breaks down, like, by column and row, you know? Um, so, but the, the, the important discovery here is that uh, they discovered deposits of 
alum, alum, alum? yeah, alum. and it's unlocking the bankers, <laughs> right? Uh, and remember, we talked about what alum was in a previous episode, and it's not aluminum. No, no, we had a whole learning experience on that episode, which was very, very fun. Alan's a whole, whole other thing. Chemistry, chemistry, dyes and leather. And it was when, when they found the deposits, like, this is going to open up the bankers' coffers. It's going to be great. And now Nori's coming by being like, yeah, so at the speed of bureaucracy, that happened. We've got money now. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really good news. 20,000 gold crowns. So that, that finances her war and may have a lot to do with why she was able to take the throne. Yeah, for sure. And that's just an accident of geography and geology. It has nothing to do with the dragon reborn, nothing to do with the end of the world. Oh, it's just bullshit. That's severe in work. They just discovered alum deposits on her lands when she needed money taking the throne. Okay, fine. That's severe fine. work. But it's not like a new trade from Aradoman or some bullshit. It was always there in the ground, waiting for the moment. But no, you're right. The discovery of it, the timing of that is, is to be honest. Yeah. The gold coins you dig up when you wish for gold have always been there. It's just the luck of digging them up at the right time. That's that's where the wish comes in. Right, but it's not like in the it's like in the two rivers where it's like, oh, now we've got, you know, glass makers and stuff, lace makers, because refugees have come in. Like, I don't know. It's fun that geology gets to play a role in this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it is funny, though, to look at where um, geology affects people migration, economics, products that people produce. I mean, there's so many ways in which the geology of a place determines who or what settles there and what you do when you are there as a job. Right. There's a reason Portland's called Stump Town, <laughs> because everybody here cut down trees for a living for a long time. And that has everything to do with the geology of the location. Borderlanders have settled down into place. Yes, that's important. Why is that important? Because next chapter we go talk to them. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, the Borderlanders Elaine situation. That is next chapter next week. And I'm not completely sure why they've settled down. I forget why, but that's, I believe, the entirety of the next chapter. So Aren't they waiting, just waiting for Rand to show up, right? Rand or Elaine. I think they came looking for Rand. Rand vanishes. Elaine shows up. They're just kind of like beach ball of doom spinning out there like. Can we talk to whoever's in charge before we, like, starve to death or get dysentery? <laughs> oh, too late. Yeah, I know. Um, so, obviously, after you get Nori, you get Rena Har 4. Because you have to. Match set. Salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. And this is where we talk about spies. Yes. Counterintelligence. Because that's what Rena Har 4 has been doing. She's been tracking them down. Yeah, and then turning them into tools rather than liabilities. Because a spy that you know and have identified is someone you can feed information to. So Rena Har 4 is becoming a little disinformation spy master person at Elaine's request. And neither of these spies are interesting. I looked them up. Neither of them are of interest. Well, yeah. I thought John Skellett, we do have a later report from him in Knife of Dreams where he reports that Aramilla plans to ride the Camelin soon. Yay. Uh, yeah, right. I, I recognized his name and looked him up because like, oh, is this the, the guy that does the thing? And no, he's not the guy that does the thing. That's somebody else. So my book is defaced with a note where I circled a name and then had to be like, no, don't don't care. There's, there's nothing here. Mm -hmm. <sighs> He's a barber. I, I want. I looked him up in Origins because I wanted it to be like he's a Jack Skellington like reference or something. But no, there's he, he's right. two no. small potatoes to have been mentioned in Origins. He's just John the Skillet. He is Iron Man, you know, because he's the Iron Skillet. Iron Skillet. <laughs> oh, we're trying. We're trying. 
Come on, Jordan, you're not giving me it's, much. It's, it's not, <laughs> this is not the be- most scintillating chapter in the whole series. <laughs> but it's, this one and the next one are too long to have combined. I Like, we wanted to combine them, but the next one is so meaty that it was like, uh, we're just getting a slow start to the new year. It's fine. You're not saying that the obscure politics of Camelin, that Elaine is pregnant chapters aren't the favorite most entertaining chapters in the series we are slogging through the heart of winter right now (laughs) that's all i'm gonna say (laughs) i mean there's some interesting relationship building and stuff in here but yeah it's there's there's a lot of of statements that don't necessarily lead to anything or mean anything beyond what they state yeah, like we've got, uh, okay, so after the first maid, we've got uh, merchants who are like, hey, you aren't going to screw up like our profit margin or whatever, right? And Elaine's like, no, that's not the plan. And they're like, cool. Well, we like you, but like, don't tell too many people that yet, just in case you lose, you know? It's just like a bunch mm-hmm. of, what, what did she say, mealy mouthed platitudes and ambiguity. It's just a day of, the slog like she's literally having an entire day of the slog like in her real ass life i look forward to supporting the queen of andor when the queen of andor takes the throne mm-hmm. wait wait yep Being and she's up there yeah, yeah you, like, you, you, uh. it sounds like you're talking about me but it really could be something that when someone else takes the throne you say, oh, yeah, the queen of andor whoever that happens to be you see it all the time around um primaries mm-hmm. You know, uh, people are asking, like, hey, Donald Trump, are you going to run again? And and people are saying, then saying, like, hey, are you going to support him if he does? And you get a lot of, like, well, I'll support whoever happens, whoever becomes the nominee for the, you know, it's like, yeah, that's that's not a way of saying yes or no. That's just a way of saying I'm, I'm going to get, if they make it, I guess, but I'm not going to support them going into it. Right. I'm a fair weather constituent. I want to see how the tides are going. Right. It's a good analogy. And that, that's how merchants are. Like fantasy or real life. The merchants are like, are you going to screw up trade? Cool. Glad you're not planning on it. Also, our support is completely conditional on whether or not you're in power. (laughs) Because profits are more important than politics. That is the way of the world as being examined here. So Elaine is tired and trying to do all the things. She's burning the candle at both ends as hard as possible and then gets drug into a bunch of walking around outside because in addition to terrible diet advice, we also have everyone forcing exercise regimes down Elaine's throat whether or not she needs it. Here, here's what you should do. Not eat anything and exercise a bunch while you're pregnant. I see nothing wrong with this plan. Nothing wrong with that. No. Mm-mm. You'll have plenty of calories. Yeah. But then also, she's got pregnancy brain and is such a dum-dum that she perversely decides not to ignore the cold because pregnancy brain just makes women crazy, am I right? I hate it. I hate it. Like, I've never been pregnant, but like <laughs> I hate it nonetheless. Yeah. I've, I've been around a few people who are pregnant who just, they, they really had issues with short-term memory. Like, that's what, when they said pregnancy brain, they're like, you know, I just, I have trouble remembering things, like coming up with words and keeping details in my head for for a a period of time. So I think it, I think there's something to it, is my understanding. I have not done the scientific research. I do not know that for a fact. But just the way that he's like, the first chapter she's pregnant, she's already acting crazy, like in a really just like stereotypy way. I'm just like, this is not. This does not feel helpful. She's barely pregnant. Right? She's like heart, like what? A week. She's like the only reason <laughs> they know she's pregnant is because of the like the image, the vision that that men have. Yeah, right. That's the only reason. Like, there's no sign. There's no physical symptoms. None. Yeah, there's no sign. None. Though she does so, just yeah. think about she can't wait for the sort of birthing sickness to share the the the, the queasy stomach with Brigida and I'm just like okay it's not birthing sickness it's morning sickness which isn't even during the morning it's all the time but it's like that's a, that's a first and second trimester thing not like a giving birth thing like it's just, mm. it's almost like he's making a point about folk wisdom around birthing is bad maybe. 
And the irony of it being that it's like the folk wisdom of like the most sex averse, patriarchy oriented European fuck waffles rather than like all the indigenous wisdom that they literally burned alive at the stake. Not to mention all of the people that they like absolutely genocided around the world who had like plenty of interesting indigenous knowledge. And now we have little bits and scraps of it being misinterpreted by fucking health crusader conspiracy purists who are like making an entire pipeline to the fucking alt right. And I hate it. Okay, sorry. Tell me how you really feel. That's fun. Way out of control. <laughs> <sighs> anyway. Uh, here's another little bit for the relationship between Elaine and Avienda. The guards studiously ignored what passed between her and Avienda. Although she thought that uh, Rasoria Domanchi. Uh, that is not said correctly. A stocky hunter for the horn with blue eyes and yellow hair occasionally found one with herons or a tiny smile. So I think that, like there's a little bit of um, lover's quarrel going on and all the guards are like looking to their head like we do not know what's going on. And meanwhile, this one hunter for the horns like, oh yeah, I know what's going on. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yep. 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 Absolutely. Completely. And then the thing that Avienda says, because it's like Egolaine's being all like, oh, so and so told you to do this, told you to do that. And, the, and then Avienda does, a, again, a very in a relationship thing. Like, no, I can tell that you are not sleeping enough and you're sitting inside too much and I'm making you go outside. Like, there's the familiarity of that is just, yeah. yeah. No, and the gu- this is not the guards' first time having to look straight ahead while the two of them bicker. Like, right. At all. They're, they're, they're practiced at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But definitely Rosoria is like, then they done that, got the t shirt. <laughs> and she doesn't do anything interesting in the book. She's just here for this moment. But like, yeah, that little smile is like, it's so gay. Right. There's the beginning of Elaine kind of recruiting the kin to be in Camelin as her sort of in her control channelers, right? Because she's teaching uh, Renee how to travel. Yeah. She's the strongest of the kinswoman. She's the only other one who can travel. And uh, she needs someone who can basically run errands for her. And so this is very much like recruiting them with knowledge. Yeah. And and she's doing some really cool... She's doing a lot of different really cool things. She's outsourcing the effort she needs to put out. She's diversifying the channel she has access to. She's also kind of breaking a bit of the Aes Sedai gatekeeping hold on being able to do things. She's like, well, if the Windfinders are getting to learn stuff, why shouldn't I teach the kin? She's letting that cat out of the bag. She's doing the opposite of gatekeeping, which is like basically the only unifying thing Aes Sedai do is gatekeep their knowledge. But Elaine's just like, no, I think it'd be cool if channelers collaborated across factions and if Camelon was a place where that happened. Like she's astute with what this is going to become. But, and we're also really seeing the dissemination of traveling, right? Lots of people have it. It's just a strength barrier. But now it's starting to be limited by who has the strength rather than who has talked to one or two channelers. It's like osmosis. And at some point, somebody figures out that if you link two channelers who are too weak to do it can do it together, right? So you can learn the weave and then link with somebody to give you strength to make a gateway. Yeah. Yeah. El- Elaine doesn't want to be caught flat-footed when there's multiple other channelers out there who could have that. She's like, no, I right. need to have that. Right. I need to be able to, to dominate the fast travel industry. And so, yeah, uh, what we've got is Rianne checking for Morella. Morella. The one who's been being terrorized by the Aes Sedai, or by the Sea Folk. Yeah. So she got sent off as an envoy to the Borderlanders. She was really excited to take a break from the Windfinders. She has now come back earlier than Elaine had anticipated. I guess just because she got set down closer to the Borderlanders than had been anticipated. Well, and the Borderlanders are all really close together, right? She, so she's able to visit them all really quickly as opposed to traveling like multiple days in between each group. They're all just like chilling out in the same. So they had all their, I think, command huts in the same spot or something like that. So she could visit them all in the same day. Yeah, she's within a few miles of each other. So she did one per right. day. So she's been running around pretty hardcore. But yeah, it hasn't been like a week of travel between each. Like they are very much mm-hmm. together as much as four independent nations armies can be together 
All the rulers are there in four camps a few miles apart. Each holds an army. I found the Shinarans on the first day, and most of my time since has been spent talking with Isar of Shinar and the other three. We met in different a different camp each day. But everybody's coming together. So she's meeting with all the groups all at once every day for multiple days. Right. And they're remarkably eager to talk, which is, I think, also part of why mm-hmm. she came back fast, is they're not there to do a war. They're there to do a diplomacy. And she got a count, right? That's part of what she was sent to do, was get a count of how many troops. And of course, Miller is like, I don't suppose you got an account, you simple little woman. Do you not know how to count? You don't even know how to count <laughs> yes. troops, do Your you? Your tiny lady brain can't handle numbers mm-hmm. that big, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's such a misogynist. And she turns around and goes, uh, it's just about 200,000. And, uh, and I doubt anyone with their own officers could be more accurate than that, right? Like, I know exactly how many people there are. Um, without actually counting up the individuals and having, like, a list of the rosters. Right, yeah, because, like, you can count the fires, you can count how many horses, like, the lines of horses, the amount of cook tents, like, there's all kinds of ways to infer that, even for an Aes Sedai who doesn't like soldiers. Mm -hmm. And 200,000 is a good number of soldiers. That's not a small army from the borderlands, like, at all. No, no. And like, even without them wanting to intimidate or attack, like they can't help but create unrest with that many swords walking around. But then you have these 10 sisters who are with them. And these are, as far as I can tell, unaffiliated sisters, right? These aren't, these aren't Codswains. These aren't White Tower. They're not Rebel. They're just, I think they're, aren't they Borderlander advisors, basically? I think most of them, I mean, it can't all be Borderlander advisors, but I believe that, it, I mean, it, each one of them has at least one. And I think some right. of them have more. But yeah, all of them have been very peripheral to all of our Aes Sedai plots and have not decided to make any kind of allegiance. They're just sticking with their Borderlander mission and following wherever that goes and have... I don't think any of them have ever been on screen in a meaningful way. Like, they're just other Aes Sedai that exist in the world and have been doing their own thing the whole plot without us seeing them. I, I kind of think of them as what the green Aja should be doing, which is the sisters who said, fuck it, I'm going to the border, I'm going to go kill some Trollocs, right? Like, that's what the green Aja should, be, should have been doing this whole time. But these, like, ten sisters are like, you know what? We see a need. We're going to be there. We're not involved in politics. We're not involved in the split of the tower. We're not involved in the Southlands. We're just here with the Borderlanders to fight the Dark One on the border. Well, I I think they're pretty involved in politics and not doing any fighting. I think they go to the Borderlands to like run around arranging marriages and settling sheep disputes. Like I don't think that they're doing a turn on the actual patrols. I want them to be. Come on, give me something. Give me something. Give me something here. Like I got. All right, fine. I'll allow that as a treat. <laughs> <laughs> These ten sisters understand the actual mission of the Eyes to Die and have been performing exemplary service the whole time. Thank you. Somebody has to be right. <laughs> yes. Yes. But yeah, Elaine recognizes that as being a really big danger when she's negotiating with them. It's always like she has a lot of stuff to do for and or with them. But the 10 sisters, she does a lot of work to make sure that they get no idea where Rand is. That's a really big part of her motivation with dealing with those 10 sisters specifically is to make sure that they just go off somewhere else. The whole like army thing is a threat to Andor, but the sisters are a threat to Rand. And so she has to manage both threats at the same time, which is, I think, probably part of why next chapter is going to be such a thing to untangle. Uh, I've got a line where I have a question for you. They're talking about the Borderlanders and they say, somehow they know of your presence in Falma when certain events took place. And this is Marelle, Marielle talking to Elaine. Mm hmm. And I'm trying to figure out, I, I assume, you know, we have to talk about, you know, I don't know what, what, it's got to be the Sean Chan, right? What, what do you mean? That they're talking about what, when Elaine was in Falma. Elaine was in Falma at the end of Great Hunt. Right. When Heron was in Falma. Okay. So Heron took words back to the Borderlanders about Elaine's involvement would be the assumption. Mm, how, Elaine. But did he, he never even knew she was there. Oh no, Hiran was <laughs> Hiran went with them back to the White Tower. Right. Hiran was part of the, the cross country right. road trip that is between Great Hunt and Dragon right. Reborn. That's right. Right. With with Varen and Egwene and Elaine and yeah. Yeah. 
so he's very aware of how Elaine was deeply involved with Rand and Falma, and it, it's all here. And right. It's all here. And okay, yeah, I was I was a little confused. I was like, it has to be here, and but I hadn't like actually worked it all out. And it's like, great, right, there was like three, four months or whatever that they were all traveling together. So right, right, that was a long time. Yeah, so here it would have been able to vouch for Elaine's character, not just her physical presence at an event but like for how she interacts and how she talked about certain people and that's probably good honestly for the borderlanders to have that deep dive into her personality from him i love that she sends morel right back in she's like hey can you go check out what the borderlanders are doing and morel's like yes anything to avoid the seafoam <laughs> anything yeah <laughs> yeah which is i think Part of Elaine's subconscious motivation, too, because she was thinking earlier about how she's going to have to teach the sea folk. And she's like, or or it's it's for it's for Ander. It's not because I don't like the sea folk. It's for Ander. Definitely for Ander. And just one note. So we don't get corrections. The she claims there are 10 Aes Sedai with the Borderlanders. But in the Path of Daggers prologue, there are 13 Aes Sedai with the Borderlanders. I was wondering if I was misremembering that. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. So does that mean that Morel missed three of them or that three of them have taken off to do something else since and there's only 10 now? Your guess is as good as mine. I want to bet that she just didn't catch them all, that she just didn't see them all, that they're still there. That's the simplest explanation. Yeah. And yeah, they uh, decide that they're going to go that afternoon to meet with the Borderlanders because traveling and that is... Exactly where we're going to pick up next week. Sama is pointing out that Rand, it sets Rand's off that there's 13 Aes Sedai with the Borderlanders, right? Like, that's bad. Yeah, so we'll just assume Rand. that Morel just missed three of them for missed, whatever missed reason. Them, right. Elaine exchanged a look with Brigida, who also shrugged, though in her case, neither from detachment nor from disdain. The largest hole in Elaine's hopes to use the Borderlanders to influence her opponents for the throne had been how to approach sitting rulers while she was merely the high seat of Tracand and daughter heir of a deceased queen. Brigitte's shrug said, be grateful for the hole closing. But Elaine wondered how these people from the Borderlands had learned what very few others knew. And if they knew, how many more did too? She would protect her unborn child. Would you be willing to go back right away, Marilil? She asked. The other sister accepted with alacrity, and with a slight widening of her eyes that suggested she would put up with any amount of stench to avoid returning to the Windfinders a little longer. Then we will go together. If they want to meet me soon, nothing can be sooner than today. They knew too much for delay. Nothing could be allowed to threaten her child. Nothing. Thank you for joining us for the beginning of Elaine being pregnant. <laughs> With so much excitement in your in your voice. I just uh, I'm glad to be back in the pod, but oof. Yeah. And now we have less less than uh, ten chapters left in this book. Yeah, this book should get us through to the end of February. We, in, If we stay on the schedule we have currently, we will be firing up the next book at the start of March. That's exciting. And then we can do the Crossroads of Twilight and just shit on that book the whole time. <laughs> oh, remind me why we do this. Because <laughs> <laughs> we know this knife of dreams after it. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's so true. It's gonna be so good. No, it's it's amazing. Like we're I I'm not I don't think we're struggling with the slog, but man, there's there's a lot there that really just doesn't have a lot of meaning. And and you you read through it and it's fun, it's world building, but there's not a lot to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's a good time to get to talk with each other and our chat no, totally. friends about 
this book the series that we've all happily suffered through however many times totally. um and yeah i mean it is but good I mean, world building there is good character building yeah. like it's good character building. it's the world yeah. you know we love this world we yeah. love being in this world but we also love <laughs> ripping on it it's true there is there are parts of it that just uh slow down yeah yeah and you know you like you said it's it's like you're taking the scenic route in the car and you get the look at all the scenery and slow down and like the kid in the back playing video games doesn't find a lot of interesting but hey you know it's pretty yeah and it's definitely part of the world very much so and uh it's lots of politics we're definitely doing some elaine succession plot stuff especially next chapter we're gonna be mm -hmm. heavy politics for elaine succession plot stuff um so, you know, that all takes time to do justice to as a plot. But this was a good warm-up episode, you know, as we're getting back into it after taking a couple of weeks off and I'm in weird circumstances and you're recovering still <laughs> a little bit. So, you know, I, th I think that's a, a good chapter to sort of just maybe take it a little bit easier on and just uh, enjoy the scenery. Yeah. Yeah. This has been great. I'm glad to be back. Glad to be able to be back. <laughs> Me too. There was definitely a point when I was like, this is never going to end. I'm going to be stuck in this miserable hole where I can't do anything ever again forever. And it was d days eight and nine were really emotionally difficult. And I kept being like, hey, do you want to record this week? And you're like, no, I told you. To <laughs> and I'm like, but, but, but maybe you could. Maybe you could. Uh, like, I mean, I'd like to. I'm, I, you know, yeah. I would if you'd like to. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's amazing how much I miss it when we're not recording yeah and also th big thanks to jess for uh being there for that last recording of the year um, oh yeah i enjoyed yeah. editing that was that was a very fun episode to listen to I'm, I'm glad jess was able to come in and do a guest appearance yeah you shut up that was that was super helpful so we didn't have a massive massive gap in content <laughs> Yeah, only two weeks of gap. It could right, be worse. Right. Uh, it's not great. Our, yeah, our download totally. numbers will take a bit of a hit, but it's all right. Yeah, we don't care. No. I mean, I don't care. I won't speak I, for you I'm there. trying not to care. <laughs> but I also got a TikTok in an effort to get us more followers. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, but, the, the, you know, if I don't release an episode and the, the numbers drop by a quarter in a month, like that's what you expect right like that's very predictable no people need to be absolutely <laughs> no yeah no i it's just i with me and podcasts i have so many i listen to that i can't keep up with all of them so it's like mm -hmm. well if you ever stop producing content i just have an opportunity to listen to one or two out of the hundred in the backlog i've never listened to which i then don't do because i have other podcasts i want to listen to new anyway i have too many podcasts to listen mm -hmm. to no, and uh, we'll definitely try and, I think, in Crossroads of Twilight, combine chapters as well. Oh, yeah. To get through. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Getting to Knife of Dreams is a priority. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> from then on out, it's like, you know, skiing downhill, right? Like, it's, it's a, but it's, it's a climb to get to there, uh, definitely. To yeah. Get through these next two books. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we will not take 30 more weeks to get through uh, Crossroads. Now, we only have one more double chapter for this book because we're getting near the end and it gets a little right, bigger. Right. But yeah, Crossroads is definitely going to gonna have some con condensing that can happen in it. And of course, don't forget, we're doing the cleansing out of order. Right. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to that. Just just to fuck with people, honestly, just really so people are like, oh, you're going to do Crossroads? You're going to do the cleansing? It's like... No, we got to get through a bunch of crossroads. First. Like, <laughs> it, it's it's the reward at the at the like we when we get halfway through crossroads, it's like okay, enjoy your treat. You've you've yeah. suffered with the spinach and the broccoli and the you know nasty greens and vegetables. Now you can get your sweets. Yes. Now now here is the tiramisu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you just know how much I'm going to go into um, the description of. The, how the power is used yep we're we're yeah. all going to get to suffer through that together <laughs> <laughs> no but uh, uh, apart from the sexual analogies which are accurate um there's just a lot of fun magical metaphysics and physics going on in that chapter with the the like shall repel and the opposite shall attract 
and just there's, there's a bunch of great stuff that I can't wait to, to talk about. Well, and our podcast art includes that. Like the podcast right, logo right. includes that scene. Like it's oh, yes, yeah, so we are going to definitely settle in for a nice long recording for that. I think after the after we get through the cleansing, we'll have to I'll have to talk to Leah and see if I can get more artwork for the end of the series. <laughs> um, right, because like we, I, I feel like we've done the first part was like set, we did uh, artwork based on Ruidian and the the visions. Mm-hmm. The second part was the cleansing, and then the third part we got to have something with the last battle. Well, yeah, after we get through the cleansing, will be about the time to put that into the the queue at the rate that she's right. gotten us art. That'll be about right, the right, right, right timing to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. How many episodes for the last battle? Yeah, probably four. That's going to be a, yeah. a mission. We're going to have to map that mm-hmm. out. We also still need to figure out when we're doing New Spring. That's still undone. I still want to do it in a 24 hour marathon session. I just want to talk for like a day straight and just do New Spring. We should figure out when would be a good time to do that. Okay. I mean, I don't, like, within the context of the books, within the context yeah. of our lives, like, that's going to be some logistics. So we should probably start putting actual pins in that just before season two drops. <laughs> or after the cleansing. We do the cleansing and then we, or maybe after Crossroads. Maybe we, we do the cleansing, get through the rest of Crossroads, and then our reward is New Spring. Yeah. Charity stream, something like that. Yeah. We should definitely do a charity. If we're going to do something that epic, we should make it a charity stream for sure. Because this community loves a good charity stream. That's true. And we could get a different guest on for each chapter, which would give us a lot more um, spongy uh, room around. Oh, we could take shifts. Shifts, yeah. (laughs) That's not a bad thought. And you know, I think I planned it out. Like, if you if you keep it down to an hour per chapter, it's only eighteen hours. So you you don't mm-hmm. have to pull a full twenty four. You can just do one ridiculously long day. It'd probably like a twenty hour day because there will be right buffer right. spots between. But yeah, but yeah, you know, I mean, New it's Spring it's possible. Not, you know, some of the chapters are actually pretty short in New Spring. Is the other thing to realize, right? Or like, cover very little. Yeah, cover very little, right? Like there's, <laughs> there are some New Spring is not the chapter where they write the names is. Ugh. Yeah, um, I, I do think it's it's one of those things where it's possible to do it. We'd be talked out. Or I'm sure the content would be terrible by the end, but you know, it'd be a lot of us giggling. It, that's why you do it for charity, <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So I, I think that would still be fun to just do something absolutely absurd with New Spring and see if we can bring the community in on it. Yeah. So just make sure to schedule it not near any of the other charity streams also, because there's a couple of annual ones. We have to make sure to get a good right. base out from them. Yeah. Charity stream and guest host. That'd be fun. If we do it to Books to Prisoners, I bet we can get Michael Kramer and Kate Redding to come on for a, an episode. Oh, well, I mean, we have to do it for Books to Prisoners. Like that's It's either yeah. them or the Light Weaver Foundation. Those are the only two options. Like... Right. And I, I think we're a books to prisoners group, personally. I, I, right. I, I think that's who right. we are. <laughs> but I, I feel like we could write them and be like, "Hey, we're going to do this thing. We're going to do a twenty, you know, twenty-four hour new spring uh, breakdown podcast." Yeah, we could ask them to do a, a do a guest do like a We'd chapter with that. us, like in the middle, right? At like a, yeah. a good hour for when a lot of the audience would be able to show up and a fun chapter. Yeah, yeah. We we should we should definitely. Flesh this out. Okay. Probably offline. Yeah. And off recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we can kill uh, recording so now, recording I think, off. probably. Yeah. yeah, let's kill recording. It's probably a good idea. But the other really important thing that we were talking about before we turned recording on was the fact that you have two bull mastiffs and one absolutely delightful Labrador behind you. So everyone who's live and watching video gets to be on puppy watch. Yep. Um, and by puppy, we mean big, ginormous dogs. But like, I mean, puppies, they're so cute. <laughs> they're puppies. Yeah. I, I wouldn't necessarily let them out with other dogs just because they're so big and they haven't been well socialized. Um, but they are sweeties as far as I, I, I'm concerned, as far as people are concerned. Yeah. Bull Mastiffs are amazing. I love them so much. No, and, and just you get to grab oh. their both sides of their face and just shake it. And they, they love it. They get, it gets them all excited and riled up. They're, they're yeah. adorable. 
their big squishy faces and big awkward mm-hmm. limbs. And I know one that I got to see over New Year's and he's, he's such a tired old boy and like, he's very tolerant of people, but like after two hours of drunk karaoke, he's just like, Oh my God, can we go yet? Like looking at his human dad, just like, Oh, my couch is right in the karaoke bar. <laughs> These are the tinker dogs, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? All bark, no bite. They're very gentle giants that just scare you with uh, a, a warning. And then sometimes they'll sit on you, right? Like that's that's how these kind of dogs were trained to immobilize people was basically to grab them, you know, and they will grab with their mouth. It's not like a bite, but it's a grab and then sit on you. Yeah, they're big, heavy dogs. And when they lean, oh, yeah. It's like a weighted blanket, but it's, it's also a dog. It's actually kind yeah. of the best. Right. I mean, if you need like a comforting, you know, thing. If they're if you're trying to attack them and they do that, maybe it's a little more confining. But <laughs> you startled them. Oh no, that's the face of a bong spill, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I apologize to your nose for that. Well, for, that's terrible. Fortunately, I, I just cleaned it it's clean water oh, but still it did end up on the computer uh, and that's always always dangerous when you're using a laptop i wish the, the the audience could really have appreciated how the two dogs' heads just came up and looked and we just all had this collective moment <laughs> oh that sucks um well while seth deals with that I can tell you guys all that, hey, uh, I'm back. My mouth is mostly healed. (laughs) Yeah, how's that going? Yeah, so it's been three weeks exactly since I went in for oral surgery to get three of my wisdom teeth removed. I just finally got the stitches out yesterday, and I'm so happy. Oh, my God. They had to reschedule me out, so they were in for an extra week, and it was the most frustrating thing. Um, but I'm basically back, though you may have noticed I sound kind of funny, and that's because I got a bit of nerve damage from the anesthetic needle on the right side, and so the right half of my tongue is still numb and will be like that for up to six months. So, uh, yeah, welcome to that sound from me but otherwise uh, (laughs) i'm good i'm good it was it was a lot guys that was the first week was a haze of just netflix and pain medication and i couldn't really eat so i like lost way too much weight and watched well i didn't watch too much netflix but i watched a god-awful amount of netflix um it was really delightful to just zone out and then after about a week i kind of popped up a bit and i could start to function a little bit and it's just been like these layers of coming out of it ever since and i'm pretty much back and i'm really glad i never have to do that again because uh oof oof i just i am so glad i don't have to do that again that was hard mouth surgery sucks as as I remember the the broken jaw was a little more extensive coming back from it, but it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think the worst part of the broken jaw was the tooth extraction, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, much like getting a piercing or a tattoo, you know, getting the surgery was not hard. It was the healing it's that the was hard. Yeah. Like the drugs worked fine. Like I was not there. For the experience, (laughs) like they give you a little bit of of an Mm -hmm. oral sedative um, and you wait for half an hour and you're supposed to get sleepy. And of course, I didn't feel sleepy. And then I sit in the chair for a minute and like I get the warm blanket and then I start to feel very sleepy. And I I got injections in my arm. I had the band-aids to prove it. I do not remember getting injections in my arm. Like they would have had to get me to like take my sweater off and all kinds of stuff. And I remember none of it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember getting home for the most part. Like Brandon tells me I was an absolute mess and could barely walk. I feel remember feeling annoyed that he thought I needed the ramp to get into the house instead of the stairs. Like it was a mess. And I was just not here for a week. I was just gone. (laughs) Like, thank you people who make TV shows for allowing me to have somewhere pleasant to go. But like, I was not here. 
And I wasn't eating, so I wasn't healing very good either. Like, it was a real, yeah. like, mm. negative feedback loop where, like, I couldn't make myself eat more than a bit of smoothie and milk every day. And I did the math. That was, I lost, like, a pound a day. Like, it Ooh. was, I was yeah. not eating. And that was really bad for healing. Once I was able to start eating again and, like, feeling like I'd take, like, my vitamins, like, immediately I started feeling better faster because, like, my body had resources <laughs> to work with again. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah, that's called the oral surgery diet. It's uh, quite actually one of the more effective ways to lose a quick amount of weight and uh, probably gain it right back again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the second I started eating again, you know, I'm like going back to my normal weight. Like it was just that was wild, guys. <laughs> that was that was very wild. Um, I'm very very grateful for living in the modern era, where oral surgery is a matter of getting super super high and then being very uncomfortable and watching TV for a week. Like, I, very grateful <laughs> that this is the day and age I live in. <laughs> but oof, that was a journey. Well, uh, being in pain is is rough. Yeah. It's just the recovery sucks. And and then when you're in that space between pain and discomfort, like the healing part when it's itchy mm -hmm. and inflamed, but not truly painful and like pain medication doesn't really do much for it. Like that was putting me back into the exact same neural pathways of trauma that braces gave me. And I was having like mm. basically flashbacks, you know, of like this. Is, I thought I was done ever needing to use these narrow pathways and I am back here again and I hate it. <laughs> Ugh. Ah, not, not a fan. Um, but it's been three weeks and I'm three teeth less wise. Yeah. Grateful for insurance because we live in a hellscape where you have to pay for your luxury bones. Also only one of the three was covered by insurance. I was told by the dentist's office that all three were, should be covered because all three were impacted. But insurance apparently decided to disagree with them about that. America. Yeah, thank goodness for mechanisms built into my insurance uh, from my husband's work that made that still affordable. I, oh, God, I shouldn't have to be worried about paying for it. That's just unfair. But yeah, modern medicine. It's a good time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, and that's my dad just had yesterday. He had some open heart surgery, which is why I'm at my parents' place. So he's, yeah, I mean, that's where they cut your breastbone open, right? <laughs> and like, that's just wild. The whole concept of it is wild. And they're doing things like, you know, pulling a vein out of his leg and putting it in his heart. And he's now part cow. He's got a cow valve. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's called a cannibal every time we eat steak or burgers or anything like that. Nice, nice. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's going to be a very long recovery for him. That's, that's a, a serious surgery when you're 80 years old. I mean, for anybody, I was thinking about him and a few other yeah. people while I was recovering, like this was just on my mouth. Like, this is minor surgery. There are people who do major surgery, like open heart surgeries. And like, it's not really that extraordinary of a thing to be like, oh, yeah, he'll be fine. It'll be a recovery. Mm -hmm. But like, you can go through so much trauma and be like, that's eh, fine. Right. It's fine. Like, ah, oh, modern medicine's wild. It's fine. Yeah. Your body's just like, no, we, we get that. Yeah, it really is. It's it's cool. But uh, oh, the things we do because people with letters after their name tell us it's a good idea. Like, <laughs> I'm going to say pe the things we do because we evolved to eat a much uh, tougher diet and have teeth fall out. So we have wisdom teeth coming in. I mean, that too. Poorly. Yeah. It's just like, yeah. it's amazing. I feel almost hustled by how fast it all happened. I went to this dentist in October for my first <laughs> visit and they examined me and they're like two rounds of cavities and wisdom tooth removal. And here we are. Like I was supposed to be completely done with it before the end of the year, like all within the fall season, I got the entire thing done. And it's like, is this a well-oiled machine or just a grift? <laughs> like that was fast, but no, it's just a, it's a really well-oiled machine. Yeah. Like that guy has been practicing for yeah. more than 30, more than 40 years. I think the he's, been in practice like he knows what the fuck he's doing it's just a well-organized office but oof. and those are the kind of problems that can lead to bigger issues if left untreated so the faster you can get to them the better oh yeah off, for sure right? cavities grow impacted teeth get more impacted 
you just want to fix that whatever you do. Yeah, but like that was fast. It was mid October. Like it was after spoiler con that I went in for my first exam and now I am done. I have done everything that they were like, you need to deal with that. I'm just to maintenance. And that, that was that was speedy. Now now I have no excuse not to get on to the next doctor that I've been delaying <laughs> talking to. <you. laughs> And if you wonder why we missed a few episodes last week, it was because Aradia, um, you know, had a mouthful Ugh. of stitches. So we decided not to podcast uh, for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, last week was I was actually supposed to be that was the day I was supposed to get the stitches out. And then that right. got canceled. But I had another meeting in town. So it was just already off my schedule. And then, But I got them out yesterday. And oh, my God, guys, it was like. The most intense taking off of a wet swimsuit or two tight socks or a bra, like that feeling when you take it off and your skin just gets to breathe again, like that, but like mm -hmm. in my mouth, it was, oh, the glory took like six hours to sink in. It was amazing. <laughs> anyway, that's my main update for the holidays. I had very, very mellow holidays. Um, saw the in-laws for Christmas and went over to a friend's house for karaoke on New Year's. Like, not much to report. Um, but you, did you do anything fun? Oh, no. I, so I worked very hard this holiday season. Um, I did not get time off. Um, and the, I've been, I've been out my current job for eight months. The guy who is, was training me and was sort of my, my, um, not, I wouldn't say supervisor, but you know, the, the lead of my shift, uh, got a job in Texas. Oh, I uh, gave us two weeks about three weeks ago. Oh my. <laughs> and left. So, and he's been there for 25 years, right? This is the, and this is the kind of job where that you really do need that experience. And they just don't have anybody to take over for his position. So I'm now just the guy in charge on my shift. Um, and they gave me another new guy to help with me. And he's technically been there longer than I have. But he's a young kid and his training sucked and he hasn't really learned anything. And oh, my God. <laughs> even though he's tech, he's... Even though he has a higher, he's, he's, uh, he has higher rank. I don't know what, what, what do you would call it in the corporate world? More Some seniority. Rank. Yeah, he has, uh, and he's been there longer. So, wow. uh, this is all, only be going on for a week. Right. And this week I took some time off because of my dad's surgery, but next week I need to go in and talk to my boss and make the added work and stress come with, the uh, added, uh, position and monetary compensation yeah it sounds like that's called for <laughs> and it's the kind of job where you can they're relatively fair about that like i feel like i can walk in there and be like look this is what you've been handed me i need something and they'll be like yeah mm. that, that makes sense well that's good that's that's excellent um but also yikes that's quite the uh, change yeah. in their process to go from a 25 years worth of experience person to an eight months worth of experience person. Uh-huh. Yep. Like that, that yep. can Me be... and the other guy. Oof. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a night crew that comes in, right? So after and before my shift and after my shift, I, there's these guys that know way more than I did to come in and they can fix everything. So, you know, as long as I don't break anything too badly... It's, <laughs> it's not a problem. So, you know, I'm basically, I'm trying to do regular maintenance and upkeep and any of the complicated problems, you know, that, that are above sort of my experience level that take a little more di diagnosing and knowing more about the tool than I know. I just basically say, that's going to sit for a couple hours. <laughs> Someone else is going to take care of it. I mean, knowing what not to do is an important part of not screwing things up. Yes. Yeah. No, and that's, I think that's where they trust me a little bit, but. It, it is, it's very much just like, oh, okay, this is going to be significant amount of work compared to what I was doing two weeks ago. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm running it. I'm realizing that, 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 you know, how, you know how I said like, Hey, you know, I've acclimated my, to my job. I'm really starting to relax a little bit. I'm not tired on, on every night. I can like go out every once in a while. That's not, yeah. Yeah, the universe heard you and was like, yeah, yeah, mm, it was like <laughs> hold my New Year's champagne. <laughs> uh, so, whew, um, 
I, let's just say I wasn't exactly upset not to be able to, uh, <laughs> I wasn't, thanks a little, Jun, uh, to record the last couple of weeks just cause I was like, damn, I'm, I was just tired. Um, little, little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad we took, we took a breather for no particular narrative reason, but just life was happening a little, little mm-hmm. heavy there. And we figured most of you were probably not having the most time to listen to podcasts anyway. Mm-hmm. So, Although if you did have nothing to do on the holidays or just craving more episodes, I'm sorry. Yeah, we, we didn't plan ahead for that quite as well as we could have. But we're back now, though this episode won't come out for a week because I'm I like my nine day buffer. <laughs> sure. Well, you just want to record two tonight? <laughs> you can just keep going for like seven oh, hours? God. No. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not prepared. <laughs> I only asked just because I know you would say no. <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, as I was saying before, I'm recording at my parents' place um, just for the holidays. And then my dad had some, some surgery, so he's in the hospital somehow sitting. Yeah, I'm using AirPods instead of my usual mic. So hopefully I don't sound too bad. I'm sure Radia's uh, fixing it all in post, right, Radia? Uh, yeah, I'm doing my usual process that I never touch or tweak between sessions. Completely <laughs> automated and out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, I'm doing that. Okay, okay. Hopefully that fixes, that does a good job on this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I do have a few things I can I can tweak. We'll see. Editor Radia, how did we do? <laughs> editing Aradia here, and uh, I tried to make this sound better. I did stuff. You can be the judge of that in this A-B example. And uh, yeah, I'm using AirPods instead of my usual mic, so hopefully I don't sound too bad. I'm sure Aradia's uh, fixing it all in post, right, Aradia? Yeah, I'm using AirPods instead of my usual mic, so... Hopefully I don't sound too bad. I'm sure Radia's uh, fixing it all in post, right, Radia? Yeah, so you can hear. I did my best, but AirPods are not ideal to record on. Well, okay, so that, that's what you're going to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be getting better this year, guys. I'm on a mission to uh, actually work on expanding my professional education like a real adult uh, in the podcasting sphere this year. That's a goal, so... I'll actually have real things to say in response to that question, like, in some time. Exciting. Oh, and uh, as a fun fun little bonus, guys, I started a lot spoilers TikTok. I don't know what's going to be on it, but if you want to see the mess that is me figuring out how to do it, then you should join it now. I'm still, I'm not sure TikTok should even be legal, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but it's everywhere. And I, I, every time I delete it, I redownload it. It was very fun to have while I was recovering from tooth surgery. When I just didn't feel like watching more TV, I had TikTok as an alternative way to dissociate. And it was really good at that. (laughs) It's so addictive and gives you exactly what you want to see. And I really needed that. Um, I'm not sure how healthy it is to have that for people who aren't recovering from surgery, but... I'm enjoying it very much, and I'm just leaning into it now. But yeah, I... Mm. Okay. <laughs> to the book! To the book. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app, or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?